body diagrams for three-dimensional rigid bodies are a lot like free body diagrams for two-dimensional rigid bodies. The steps are about the same. First of all, choose your object. Choose it wisely so that you know what you're including and what you're not including. Add any applied loads that are given to you in the problem, applied moments or, or forces. Add the reaction loads from everything that's not part of your object. So every support that you have that you've removed in choosing your object, you have to ask how was it constraining your object. Then we're going to add distances, angles, etc. But the question becomes, how was the support constraining your object? Was it keep it from, keeping it from translating? Then you have a reaction force. Was it keeping it from rotating? Then you have a reaction moment. Now in three dimensions, any object like this can move up and down, right and left, or forward and back. Every one of those possibilities gives you a possible reaction force. So you have three possible reaction forces. It can rotate forward and backwards, right and left, or twist. So you have three possible reaction moments. We're going to start with the reactions that you get with no moments at all. So for example, if I had a ball on this surface, I only have one force as a reaction. It's just a normal. The ball can move in any direction it wants except through the surface. So I have one force along a known line of action. This is the same thing as if I have a cable attached to my block. The block can rotate in any way it wants. It can move up and down. It can move right and left. What it can't do is move away from the rope. So my rope is giving me one force in a known line of action. Same again with the surface. It can move, it can rotate, but it can't go through the surface. I have one can't, I get one force. I can get two forces from a situation like a roller on a rail. If I have a rail like this and I take my roller, it can still rotate in any direction. It can even twist a little bit on the rail, but what it can't do is slide perpendicular to the rail or through the surface. So a roller on a rail will give me a force perpendicular to the rail and a force perpendicular to the surface. A roller on a rough surface is the same situation. It can roll, but it can't go down perpendicular to its rolling path or through the surface, so I get two forces there. When I talk about a rough surface, now I have three because this isn't going to roll. I have no opportunity for this to slide down, right, or through. A rough surface will give me all three forces. The most common place you'll see this one is with a ball and socket. So if you consider your shoulder, which is a ball and socket joint, your arm, the free body diagram of your arm, your arm is allowed to rotate up and in this direction. That's a rotation in that direction. You can rotate your arm here, which is a rotation in that direction, or you can twist it, which is a rotation along the length of your arm. All three of those rotations are allowed, so I get no reaction moments. You definitely don't want to translate your arm, though. It's called dislocating your shoulder. That hurts. We can get reactions with moments, though. I can get three forces and three moments. If I have three possibility ways that this can move, for example, if I put this roller in the block and, and fixed it in there, then I can no longer move or rotate the roller. It's stuck. A fixed support gives you all of your constraints. Three forces and three moments. The easiest way to draw a moment is with a double-headed arrow like that. So you'll see that I have FZ and MZ. They're in the same line of action. The moment that's constrained away here, the reaction that's constrained is that direction. The direction from your moments is set by your thumb. You can get three forces and two moments from a thing called a pin and bracket, or a thrust bearing, or even a hinge. If I consider the free body diagram of this white piece of board, I can't translate it in any direction. I can't rotate it in this direction, that would be taking one end and lifting it up. I can't twist it in this direction, which would be sort of twisting it this way. But I can do this. If I can rotate it in that direction, that means I don't have a reaction moment here. If it can move, there's no moment. A thrust bearing is something that looks kind of like this. This is a, a bearing of a sort. Inside, there's a nice ring that would keep this from sliding through. So as this is rotating, 
It can rotate, but it can't move in any of the three directions. It can't really twist up. The rod that went through this bearing couldn't twist in this direction or that direction, but it can spin. That gives you all but one possible translation or rotation. So I have this situation. I can get three forces in one moment from a universal joint. A universal joint looks like this. I can't translate the top at all with respect to the bottom. So if my support is down here, and my object is up here, I am constrained away from moving in any direction, translating. That gives me three forces. I can, however, rotate this way. That would be allowed motion in that direction, no reaction moment in that direction. I can rotate this way. That is allowed motion here, no reaction moment. What I can't do is twist them independently. If I can't twist them, then I have a reaction moment in that direction. This is actually used for transmitting torque from one thing to another, and it's important that they can't twist independently. The last two cases we want to talk about are the journal bearing. That would be this kind of thing without that lip inside. A journal bearing is often used in conjunction with the thrust bearing. When you have a journal bearing, you have two forces and two moments. This now will allow the rod to pass through and twist along its axis, but nothing else. The last special case is when you have two or more bearings or hinges together. There may or may not be forces along the axis, depending on whether or not you're talking about journal bearings or hinges. But what you want to do is neglect any reaction moments here. The trick is, when you have these two forces, they are able by themselves to resist both translation in this direction and rotation perpendicular to them. So once you have these two, you no longer need to consider the reaction moments.